Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, where we phone audio engineers and producers at home, and thanks to the pandemic lockdown, they answer. Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, everybody. I'm here with Jay Watson. Uh, Welcome to ISO Booth, Jay. Hi there, how are you? Good. Uh, Jay is best known as one of Australia's top gun gigging multi-instrumentalists. He's toured extensively with Tame and Parler and Pond. He's also just released a new single called Out in the World under his recording moniker Gum, uh, worth checking out, um, including the evocative video clip, Jay, which was a bit of fun. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. I did it uh, in LA with a friend of mine, Laura Lynn. Um, yeah, I don't know. Videos are hard, but um, but I I find that if you can um, at the end of them, if you if you're like pretty happy with them, then it, you know what I mean. Then then it's uh, then it's turned out all right. It's Cause pretty they, good souvenir they for, for, uh, for posterity as well. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. I saw one comment on YouTube that said I was balding. I didn't like that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, other you, than that, you get on YouTube, you're sort of a uh, fair game, I guess, aren't you? But it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we're here to talk technology, we're here to talk studio, um, and um, I think everybody would be uh, particularly interested in your relation to, relationship to the recording studio, Jay. Like, what's your current situation? Probably, I gather, not the best as far as recording studios go. Well, at home, I've, mm. we, I live in a, quite a small house just outside of Fremantle, mm. and um, I had a baby not long ago and so that was I had a room in my house full of gear mm. I moved that to the uh, like lock up facility nearby you know mm. so now in my lounge room at the moment I've got because I'm still working on remixes and we're just working on stuff for the next Pond album and just a bunch of stuff so I've got this Apollo twin interface yep which uh which I really like actually that's the, that's all I use in my regular studio too sure but I just had heaps of stuff summing to it, you know, because I can't record more than a couple of things at a time anyway. Sure. Um, so, it, yeah, in my lounge room, I've just got this Apollo Twin. I've got a few mics. Um, I've got this 57. I've got these two of these old ribbon mics I like, these Bayer uh, M260s. Okay, yep. I like because they're kind of, you can still get them quite cheap and I think they sound really good. Mm. And I've got a, a Roland... Uh, what's it called, HS60, which is like the cheaper Juno synthesizer with built-in speakers. Oh, okay, sort of the, uh, yeah, sort of the, let's say the Casio version of the... <laughs> yeah, it looks like a Casio, it's sort of grey. It sounds really good though, yeah, yeah. and the speakers have become come in really handy uh, in this uh, in this time. Mm. And then I've got an old Pianet thing in here um, with speakers as well, which is really handy, and I've got a little tiny Roland Jazz Chorus and a few guitar pedals, and that's it. Yeah. And, I've, and I've got an 808, which is also really, really useful. <laughs> and um, and a couple of just weird old drum machines, because obviously I can't record drums in my house, in my tiny house. Sure. Yeah. So uh, when did you first start, like, let's just have the quick two-minute tour of, I guess, your, um, your, your kind of music... Um, origin story and your um recording studio uh, origin story how'd you how'd you get into this um well when i was i guess when i was in high school and played in bands and stuff when i, I, I don't think it really ever occurred to me how you made um recordings mm. we we used to just have a dictaphone for like our high school band, you know. Mm-hmm. I think we went as far as um, like exporting them off the dictaphone and putting them on our iPods and showing them to everyone at school and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I guess that was that sort of strange time where none of us really had, no one was recording to tape any, I guess the early 2000s anymore, mm-hmm. but none of us had our own computers, you know. And I don't think I would have been allowed to. I don't even know what the software was at the time. I guess Pro Tools existed, but a 13-year-old in, like, country WA didn't have it, you know? No, that's right. You probably sure. would have had, uh, let's see, Acid. Acid was a big deal 15, yeah. 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't have any of that yeah. stuff. Um, but when I moved to Perth for uni in, like, 2006, 
I moved in um, to a house with some guys I'd met um, playing at like, you know, like the PCYC and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Yep. And in that house was um, Joe and Nick from Pond lived there and Kevin from Tame and Parlour lived there. Mm. And Kevin had this, um, he used a, like an old boss digital uh, eight track, like a big chunky one. And Nick and Joe, I think, maybe by that point or maybe a bit later, they would bought themselves the kind of newer, smaller, but still boss digital 8-track. And they all had their own saved, like, you know, um, reverb settings and, like, guitar distortion settings and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And they had – everyone had – now I think back, it was amazing the, the, like, lack of gear everyone had and sure. still made recordings with. All the guitars were always DI'd, you know. Yeah. Um, Yep. Drums, people would go to our our friend's pub and just do, you know, enough drums for a year and a day sort of thing and take all the, take it all home. But that's, but I ended up buying myself one of those things too. One little boss, boss things. I can't remember what model they are, but early Pond and Tame Impala stuff was all recorded on these things. Yeah. Um, and we thought they sounded really, really cool. Mm. And they definitely have some sort of a sound, but, but I would, um, I would never use them now. In fact, we try. I remember a couple of years ago we we pulled them out, for, you know, out of nostalgia. Yep. And I played with it for about two hours, and then was like, oh, it sounds rubbish, you know. <laughs> so we we left it left in the past. I don't think it's a, is a particularly um, flattering yep. medium, you know. <laughs> but just talk to me a little bit about this. Uh crazy uh frat house that created you know such amazing sounds like if you if you had a time machine you could you could charge a lot of money uh for a room in that house i guess so yeah i mean it was um it wasn't it wasn't it was it was a crazy house it wasn't a crazy frat house in that we didn't really have any parties and there certainly (laughs) There certainly weren't many like other people there that often, right? Um, but it was disgusting. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't remember huge amounts because I was kind of just really young. I was, I'm the, I was the youngest by four, or five years. You know, oh. Oh, that's not true. Maybe Joe's maybe three, right. four years old. We would say the Tame guys were four or five years older. Yeah, but they're like big brothers. I guess so, well, especially then, yeah. You don't, I don't really think about it now, but then, yeah. Sure. Um, but, I, yeah, I do remember that there was, there was so much crap on the floor that we had to um, – it was like a path from the doorway to, the, to each bit of the house, like actually <laughs> like, a, um, like a foot-wide path right. <laughs> through the field. It was kind of – it wasn't it, – it's not actually that – much of an exaggeration to compare it to like um you know black books mm, yes at its worst it was actually like that that uh, bookshop <laughs> um yeah 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 um and uh what were the jam sessions like well we often didn't really have enough um there was a really terrible drum kit that no one sort of record ever recorded there and we often didn't really have enough working amps or and people didn't really own enough to do. We would occasionally sort of do these, yeah, these sort of ad hoc jam sessions. Mm. I think Joe, who's in Pond, he was the only one that had a, like a sort of um, decent paying job. He was a jip rocker, like roofie. Right. And so he would occasionally come home with like a, you know, Fender basement head he bought off Gumtree or something that we, you know, that was – Everyone else had little PV amps and stuff like that. Yep. Um, so he was kind of the gear guy, and he'd come. He'd come home with a. I remember he came home with like a Chaos pad once, and that was good fun. Um, but mostly it was um, it was it was weird. It was like jamming on these Boss eight tracks. Yep. And everyone would work on their own stuff, and then you'd invite one of the other guys in the house to play bass on your. Sure. And you'd sit, you know, cross legged on the floor, DIing bass for an hour. Or, yeah. Um, sure. But yeah, we occasionally had. Also, we were we were in the middle house in a triplex. Okay. So we so we we made a lot of noise, but but we couldn't make like super duper amp noise. Otherwise, we got knocks on the walls, you know. <laughs> Knock yeah. through the walls. But 
the neighbours were, were amazing. Like, we often think about the neighbours in that place because the, the amount of just mm. just noise and smoke and filth they must have put up with, you know. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're very grateful for them, for them not uh, dogging on us, you know. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, can you describe, I guess, um, more recently, I guess, sort of that uh, journey you've been on of, like, finding um, your sound, like, I guess, the matching the sound in your head with, um, you know, like a production aesthetic and sort of how, you, how you've been able to get there and what are some of the key... Um, watershed moments that key aha moments in that journey where you go wow this actually takes me a lot closer to what i'm imagining um well i think um sorry i'm not really using the mic <laughs> so, i just want to say to anyone watching this sorry i'm using the laptop mic i didn't really know how to get it work i didn't know i thought it might be a transcribed um, interview so sorry. uh snuck that up on you it's all right uh, yeah. no 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 um <laughs> I just just for when people on YouTube complain about the uh, the wow. my that 57, 57 <laughs> yeah. sounds like trash. <laughs> yeah, um, I think a big thing for me was um, I was always trying to make stuff sound. I can't think of a better word, you know, like sort of warm and tapey, yep. whatever yep. those words mean. But because I didn't really understand how much went into that. I thought for years that it just sort of involved rolling everything off at the top and, you know, yep. high passing everything and just I would just do really sort of broad um, uh, EQing, which kind of just made everything sound really horrible, you know. I didn't realise that more went into records sounding a certain way than just, um, you know, waving the dots around on the Ableton EQ. Yep. In it. Uh, and also, it never really occurred to me that, um, you know, you've got, it'll be like plus or minus 20 dB on an Ableton EQ or something like that. Whereas if you've got an old pool tech or something, it's not these extreme, you know, I'd be making these huge hills and peaks and um, troughs yep. and just kind of ruining things. So I think, um, I think now I try and make things it's all a lot more like it's trying to get it to get, sound really good on the way in yep. and not compress it too much on the way in, you know, and not EQ it too much. And then just doing little things and, and, and it all adding up yep. in the track rather than kind of mangling. Occasionally I'll, I'll mangle something for effect, you know, mm. but, um, yep. and on the one hand I regret a lot of, we regret, I think all of us, the way a lot of the early records sound, but at the same time, I think because everyone has access to the same um, bits of information and plugins and and um, and stuff these days, that maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it was a good thing, and maybe everyone's recordings are getting quite homogenous sounding. You know, mm. if you two people own a own a, a um, you know I don't know like a old DBX compressor, they both sound quite different. Whereas if everyone's using the same DBX 160 plug-in, you know, sure. then maybe everyone's snare drums are sounding the same, you know. So yep. everything, I we try think, and um, I was just going to say, I don't think there's any danger of your uh, recording sounding like everybody else's. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes we get, I mean, I, I would say out of everyone in the gang, I'm, I'm one of the least... Um, I know what I'm doing the least, you know. Sure, but the, I, but it doesn't matter when you know you judge by the results. You're not judged sure, by the yeah. process. Yeah, sure. I listen. I listen to like a lot of music from a lot of um, for a lot of different time periods, you know, and a lot of music from now. And I'm just I um, I think like I think taste trumps. Uh, technical ability you know yeah. yeah it's good I, I i do wish i knew more and i would love um one day to have the time to do like an actual course or something you know mm -hmm. because because the more you know the more that you can sort of implement your exact taste mm -hmm. um, but i'm lucky that i've got a lot of people around me and um and say even when we go on big tour with tame and Fowler upon there's people who know a lot more than me that i can um yeah constantly ask about 
stuff with you. Know? Yeah. So maybe give me an example of uh, like a go-to aspect of your recordings, say like your vocals and how um, how that maybe evolved over the years and you found, I guess, your voice insofar as the mic and the signal path and how you want it to sound um, in the mix. Yeah. Um, well, I used to, the first... For example, the first two gum solo albums, it was just, I just, you know, I had one lead and one mic cable and like a focus right interface or something. That would have been the first stuff I did post the eight track. And I would just sort of plug things directly into that. And then I slowly would, you know, I got one, um, you know, uh, BAE lunchbox preamp, you yep. know, and then everything went through that. Sure. And then by the third album, I had a full lunchbox full of stuff. I had like that preamp and a DBX EQ and I had a um, a Neve tape emulator. Okay. And so I thought, right, here's this, you know, this is my uh, this is my ticket, and I just sort of ran it all on a hundred the whole time. <laughs> and then realised after I made that record that it kind of it made everything just really like dumpy and pillowy, and it sort of rolled the top off and somehow made everything a bit subby or something. Right. So. You know, so for the next one, I died, had a little bit on there in the chain. So that, so now I have a heap of um, really nice stuff. Mm. But I still actually use that lunchbox. That's just my, like, the vocal chain. Mm. So it goes into this. Um, and then, I, I, I don't know, I always change my mind with microphones. Um, I was using an SM7V, I think it's called, yep. for a while. Um, and then I kind of, I got... But that you always have to kind of high pass a bit to to get the sound good. Yep. So then I, I don't know. I, I, I just go through phases. I think the I realised that it's a lot harder to make to make a really to make a really um, poorly recorded vocal sound nice and clear and good than um, than it was to do what I often do, which is record it really nicely. Now, like I've got one of these new Neumann, I don't know what they're called, TLM one hundred three. Yeah, sure. And then that through the really nice um, pre's and stuff, and then I can filter it and make it sound like a megaphone, you know, if I want, if I want to, or I can leave it really open and 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 beautiful and warm sounding. And and I think the newest one that's record I've done that's coming out soon, um, it has there's like really well for me really hi-fi bits and then still really sort of mangled bits. But at least I'm mangling what was a nice sure. bit of audio, you know, yep. rather than trying to get get some rubbish audio to sound fatter or something, you know, which is what we I, I and we used to have to do a lot. Yep. And in the mix, um, your vocals tend to be quite wide, don't they? They're. Um... Um, yeah, I I uh, I find it hard to 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 not double track myself mm. i think we uh get, we all sort of do um with the last poms record we made a concerted effort to to um have nick only sing you know like be brave enough to have a lot of it just one vocal yep and i'm sort of getting there but i find that even when i um even when i do use just one vocal i end up putting like you know like um like sound toys micro shift or something on it yep um because i just a lot of it's just getting kind of embarrassed to hear your own voice. And as I get more confident, I'm mixing the vocals louder. I'm taking the four-second reverb off them. <laughs> and I think that's another thing about the, the early records is it never really occurred to us that you had to sort of um, – we don't have to, but that it was good to high-pass reverbs and stuff like that. There'd be all this just yeah, – right, wash up in every, um, every stem we had, you know. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Sometimes I think that latest single, I, it never really occurred to me how wide they were. And I think when I opened up the session again, yeah, they were just, it was like double tracked and hard fan, which I don't know. But yeah, a lot of it's, um, a lot of it's, it's terrible, but a lot of the time I'll just do something for fun or not even realize, realize I'm doing it with automation wise. And then, but I like I'll bounce it off six months later and hear them hear it back on my Spotify and be like, oh I forgot to 
you know. Uh, <laughs> you have to uh, put the vocals back in the middle or something. But, uh, but which is really weird because I'll be I'll spend that six months like, you know, working on the bass sound or something. Mm. That's 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 that at the end of the day is kind of more irrelevant than like <laughs> than whatever crazy thing I just didn't set and forgot with the vocals. Sure. Okay. You got selective OCD. Yeah, mm. and yeah, I um. Yeah, it's weird. I, I'm eternally embarrassed about the way that I do things. I'm embarrassed even doing an interview about making music, you know. But that's yeah. I, I try and I try and use it to my to my advantage, I guess. Yeah. The um the 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 uh, the na- naivety, naivety. Sure, and it's uh, if, it, if it results in creativity, then um, yeah, it's, totally. Uh, yeah, I've I've actually started um. We've started for this new Pond record doing drums, and I did this on the upcoming Gum record at um, my friend's studio, who's not well, not with us and who's not Kev either, and mm. um, just and recording other stuff there just to not have to worry about how it's coming in, you know. Mm. And um, that's been really nice because we've never I've never really done that before, mm. and he's he's great. Um, you can do it digitally, or you can do it on this sort of Tascam 16 track he's got that's set up really nice and it's um, mm. uh, it's just nice to not uh, to be creative and not actually have to worry about it for at least part of your, your album you know yeah yeah um, and then in Pond also we have James the drummer who's been playing for the last couple of years he's a really good um, mixer and so it's good as well that now we have him and um, and it's just kind of safe and we the rest of us can worry about. Yeah, I guess sometimes just worry about making the noise rather than how we cap- how well we're capturing it sure. and how we're then mixing it. Yeah, you know? yeah, that that does result, I guess, in a lot of creativity. So, yeah, um, how so? Is this all kind of just down the street, or um, you got a bit of a almost a community going on in Fremantle? It's it's all pretty close. Mm. I mean, um, I mean, the last the the, the, the my solo album that's coming out soon, um, I just did in my house, mm. but it was quite, by the time I ended up packing it up, it was pretty um, serious. And it wasn't sound treated or anything, but it was just like walls of keyboards and preamps and tape echoes, and it was, it was cool. Um, and then we, that Kev has his studio that's, I don't know, you know, five minutes drive. And then my friend who I was talking about before, he's going to be 10 minutes drive. Yep up into the, um, there's a few studios in the sort of industrial area outside Frio. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, cool. that's where the more sort of professional, right. um, you know, rooms are out there. Is uh, Eskimo Joe in your area? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, the um, fourth or fifth Pond album was recorded at their studio right. in like two or three days. Yeah, I don't know if they still, if those guys still own that, that place. Right. But um, yeah, they're from Frio. Yeah, mm. cool. So, uh, what's uh, you mentioned bass? Like, what's what do you um, most enjoy tooling around with and perfecting in the studio? Um, I think that um, the thing that I'm probably the least experienced at, but I kind of think is the most important thing is drums, mm. and um, I, I think that's why I've used drum machines. And samples and stuff so much is because it's. Um, I think my taste in like recorded drums has always been better than my ability to reproduce it. You know. Yep. Um. And it's I'm slowly getting there, and also I've never I've never had a place to my own that I've been able to have a drum kit set up and mic'd up yep. so my dream and it uh, is to like have one so I'm just permanently set up mic'd up with the mics I like mm. tune the way I like mm. that I can just you know flick the power on and it's ready to go mm. um but I've never had that and so yeah um but that's the thing that I spend a lot of time listening to um recordings to and just and um, kind of obsessing over um so what are your most uh what, what are the sounds that <clears throat> you're, you're listening to from those bands of the past, I guess, who um, that most influence you. What are the what are the drum sounds that are the most influential? Um, I, I, I go between uh, 
different things, you know. Like um, I think for years it was the, the gold standard was just that that kind of um, like late era Beatles thing, you know, where it was really um, they were kind of you know dead, slightly yep. tuned drums and and. Um, and then you do that, listen to that and, and try and do that for long enough and then suddenly like the idea of them being really high, tuned high and jazzy and open is really appealing and then you realise that's actually really hard to do well and um, it just changes. Yeah, I think I think now um, I know enough. I know enough about lots of different types of music that – it's kind of just song by song now. Every song, try and make them sound slightly different. If we, even if we record, you know, drums for five songs in a day for a pom album or something, mm. we'll um, we'll do our best to sort of um, process them differently on each track, you know. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I think I think almost always now it's some sort of mix of real drums and um, a drum machine or, sa or sampled drums. Okay. Um, and then it's just choosing which one to, you know, to let have the kick drum and which one to sort of shell and just sit in there. I think the last Pond album, I think every song is actually like that. Mm. Um, but for me that's kind of the best of both worlds is you get to still have um, – you get this. You get the sort of like um, robotic vibe, mm. but then the freedom of drum feels and stuff flying around, you know, yeah. and and the almost and the sloppiness of drum feels yeah. flying around, but the song still motoring along. Sure. So, um, so I yeah, I probably haven't made a song without that combo in a while. I think, for example, that like, that new gum song has that. It's like a it's like a drum sample from an old record which I won't say because I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> uh, and then uh, and then a drum machine underneath and then the chorus like real feel you know real drums come in gotcha. over the top gotcha. which is which is um, can be problematic sometimes because you get um, stuff sort of flaming and and I, I, one thing I would love someone to explain to me properly one day is like phase Every now and then a mastering engineer will be like, this, this is horrible phasing on your mix, you know. Um, and I still just don't really know how to check it properly. I know when, you, when you're when you recording a drum set how to do it. Yep. But I just mean between stems and, like, and different frequencies, um, you know, yeah, going right. out of phase. So yeah. I'm, I'm really bad with that and I wouldn't be surprised if when I do know, when I do understand it properly, I'm horrified at, you know, a bunch of our recordings. But, <laughs> well, well, you yeah. can invest in a, uh, in a DK um, jellyfish phase meter. That's always good fun for, uh, for guests to, uh, to watch when, you, when you're monitoring. And how does it, what it's just like a deck that just sits on your desktop and has a stereo. Yeah. And then, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll send you a link. Yeah, send me a link. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, some of the other guys um, would understand it a lot better than I do. I just, and then there would be other, uh, and then the others might not might understand it less. But uh, and then there's just the element of uh, mastering guys who you know we know and love, but you know they've they've got um, a extreme proficiency in a in, you know in, in finishing off a record. So we don't so, we, we don't want to stop them from doing their job as well. <laughs> yeah, I think totally, and I think about, and then I think. Uh, you know, there are people who um, there are people who their favourite same and parlor thing is the first TP, and I remember Kev tried to get someone to master that in two thousand eight or so, and they 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 wouldn't do it. They said it was too shoddy, you know. But then, but then people who don't um, know audio, they're like, oh, that one sounds cooler, you know, That's clearly cool. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I try not to get too. Um, I would like to know a lot more, but I try not to let it, yeah, like you said, hinder actually just making stuff. Mm. So tell me about your, um, your keyboards. Um, is, is that one of your great loves? Um, I think, 
Yeah, I think I'm pretty obsessed with pretty much all gear that makes noise, really. But um, but I'd say that I I'd say that I yeah I have more interest in them than just collecting loads of guitars because of the wider you know spectrum of sounds they can make. Mm, yeah. Um, What's in your uh, top five um, family favourites when it comes to keyboards? Um, I have a an old Wurlitzer which is which is really sort of busted and I but I, I haven't found someone to fix it from yet but but I love the sound of those things mm. my favorite synthesizer is probably still this one called a pro one sequential circuits yeah. I don't know why I just find it easy to use and easy to dial all all my favorite synths you kind of can't make them sound bad mm. even if it's the most ridiculous uh, uh, like a musical sound it still sounds appealing yep. so that's so I like like that with keyboards I think um uh, what else do I like? Uh, I've never owned a Juno actually until this this sort of um, this one I bought here because they by the time I sort of thought about buying one they were I thought they were too expensive. Mm. What yeah. they are, I missed the boat, but then I, one of these came up on Gumtree really cheap. Mm. And I really like that. Um, a lot of things I've used that I love, I just I um. I don't want to spend the money off. I think my favourite ever poly synth is a Profit Five, um, but there, you know, it's ten thousand dollars. Monstrous, yeah. Monstrous. Yeah. And what? I remember. I, I think when we did the the weather, the pond album, the weather, we had so many cool synths around, but we ended up just for ease using this um, little Archeria micro brute. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and that thing. Uh, is great, you know. Mm, yeah. So I don't know. There's, I could go. I've got loads and loads of keyboards, but um. Mm, yeah. But I now the thing is now I try and do you remember that um Marie Kondo? Do you remember that documentary everyone or that Netflix thing everyone watched? Yeah. Which I I like did that with gear. I was like I would pick up a pedal or a synth or something. I'd be like if it doesn't if it you know if it if I'm even slightly umming and ahhing about it, yeah. I put it on Gumtree. Sure. So I've gotten rid of heaps of stuff. And, and uh, for years, I, I, I didn't own any really nice synths or guitars or anything. I would just have piles of tes- Tesco guitars and <laughs> Casios. You know what I mean? Yeah. Half of them working. Yep. Now I've tried to sort of slowly sell stuff and buy just really nice things that take up less space in my house. You know? yep. Sure. So what's your... Uh fantasy studio going to look like you like you clearly you can't you can't go too long um you know living in a house with no studio or is the goal to get, yeah. get a room somewhere well we've 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 got a room now with um pond but yeah. with this corona stuff we can't um go and meet up there yeah but my 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 goal is to um is to um you know, save up and try and get a bigger place so I can have a studio out the back of my house. I think I work best just doing like, I pretty much do an hour a day or something every single day. Yep. It doesn't sound like much, but or an hour or two, but it adds up over six months of when you're not on tour. Sure. And so the idea of just having it past the lawn, you know, at the back of the house. Yep. Um, and I, would, I think if I ever did that, I would do it properly and get someone to build a box for me and have it sound really nice. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the funny thing about, um, audio is that like the more, the deeper you get into it, the more my dream studio probably looks pretty similar to a lot of people's dream studios, you know, it's probably, I would probably wouldn't have huge amounts of gear, but I'd have, you know, a couple of classic compressors and a really nice old valve EQ and just things like that. And I, I don't really have the patience to record and and get people to repair tape machines very often, but I, so we, so I often just have a um, you know we'll have like a reel to reel. We just put certain stems on, or I've got this old Tascam Porter studio, and I'll just dump drums on back. I always wanted to have like you know like an eight track and a mixer set up properly, but um, as soon as it even slightly breaks, I'll like never touch it again. So I kind of it has to be um um. Yeah, like it's rock solid, function, yeah. yeah. Um, which is why I have so many 
old tape echoes and stuff too because I'll one of them will stop working. Sometimes they stop working and I like that the way they stop working. <laughs> I'll just use it as a preamp or something because I like the way it sounds. Yep. Um, I had an old chorus echo that it was, I don't know how it did, but it just had a really weird rhythm to the um, repeats and I used that heaps. Yep. And, and then I remember I got back up to it and, and Nick from Pond had um, very kindly got it serviced for me. And <laughs> it was never the same. Like, never the same, yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think my dream studio would be pretty uh, – th- how I had it set up in my house and how, uh, what, and what was almost my dream, if I could fit a kit in there, was just I just flicked like one or two PowerPoints on, mm. the whole thing fired up, and um, I had all the keyboard sums to mixes and every, and I didn't have to pull in or plug in – pull out or plug in anything ever. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what I really asked for is to be able to like – ideas without um having to you know spend 10 minutes setting uh, the signal up you know yeah being creative instantly yeah Yeah. um uh just to wind up um jay i thought um as a as a muso um are there any specific kind of muso related things that you've hoarded with the covid crisis or needed to or regretted not hoarding um do you mean like equipment or or even uh, chisels? Um, I don't know. Chisels. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, what have I got? I've kind of got everything. I I would love a new um, laptop. One of the fans on mine is is dead, which is probably why it's noisy because one's <laughs> one's uh, overworking laptop overworking. Then and I don't know whether to buy a new laptop for huge amounts of money or get it fixed but i don't know if you can take it to someone and get it fixed anymore i don't know is that an essential service oh uh, yeah <laughs> it is for yeah. some i think for some <laughs> so other than that i'm kind of set here and i'm actually really um i'm finding it weirdly liberating like we've been working on stuff the pond and it'll be mm. i'll do some backing vocals or something mm. and um i don't know it's just really nice having just nothing and then I can hear quickly if it's going to be professional enough or not. And, um, but I think, yeah, I think once you know what you're doing a bit more, you, you really don't need much to get it, um, to get it working. Okay. I set up every, every day I'll set up all this stuff in the lounge room. Um, like the, the one amp I have and a bunch of pedals and stuff record for a day and then pack it all down in time for, you know, (laughs) time for the family to watch dinner. But I'm actually really enjoying, yeah, not being distracted by just heaps and heaps of equipment. Um, I think I'm actually probably getting more stuff done, and mm. um, even if the threat of sounds is narrowed somewhat, narrowed somewhat, yeah. Mm. Well, it sounds like the pandemic is suiting you uh, just fine, um, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the the new gum album and also I guess the forthcoming pond album and yeah. hearing your handiwork. Um, thanks very much for um, sharing uh, your experiences with the audio technology readers and um, yeah, hopefully talk again to you soon, Jay. Yeah, thanks very much. You too.